right. John chapter 20. At this point in time, you know, from, from John chapter 13 uh, and, and on, it's, it's the last days of Jesus' life. And, and so we've looked at the fact that Jesus spoke to the disciples and, and, and he taught them and, and he ministered deeply to them. And, and then he goes out into the garden to get Gethsemane. He's, he's betrayed by Judas. He's, he's taken. He's tried like five different times, marched around the city. He's eventually scourged. His, his back is, is ripped open uh, by a, a, a man with a, a specialized whip. And, and then he goes to the cross and he, he carries his, his, his item of, that, that's going to kill him to... to a hill called Calvary. And then last week we looked at the burial and the early hints that something spectacular had happened. The stone had been rolled away and, and, and we see this as, as early uh, disciples show up Sunday morning after the Sabbath time to, to re-anoint his body with oil and they show up and they're, they're there and something's happened, the, the, the stone's been rolled away. And we know that the Sadducees didn't roll the stone away and steal the body because they never produced a body to try to prove that he didn't resurrect. The, the Roman soldiers certainly didn't roll that stone away because why would they do that? They'd be in great trouble and perhaps under the death penalty if they had done something like that. And could you imagine uh, a Jews coming to try to steal the body and, and, and rolling away this this 3,000-pound stone, rolling it uphill and taking on this garrison of Roman soldiers and, and uh, um, taking Jesus, this body, out of 100 pounds of spices and oils and aloes and, and, and then taking him out of it and carrying this slippery naked body through the city as good Jews? Could you imagine that? It's not going to happen, right? And so they get there, and the, the, the stone's been been rolled away and Peter and John ha had run to the to the tomb and were informed that John won that race of course um, <laughs> but Mary was also there and she showed up with other women they were all named Mary and <laughs> they left but she was there alone and that's what we're looking at today John chapter 20 verse 11 and it says, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. Mary Magdalene, she was a woman from Galilee. And she followed Jesus with radical dedication. And if you really look at where she shows up in the scriptures, everywhere she was allowed to be, she was close to Jesus. Every time she was allowed to be close to him, she was there. She wasn't like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus and I'll catch up with him when I have time. She was there every time. And um, she wasn't there, you know, when Jesus would take the disciples themselves aside. But every time she could be there, she showed up. Scriptures tell us that he who has been forgiven much loves much. So we know that this woman had had seven demons cast out of her. We know that she was from a city that was along a Roman road and much of what would happen in that city was basically it was a truck stop and many times prostitutes, women that were down and out and needed to make money would go to this city to make money. And so most likely she was a prostitute before she came to know Jesus Christ. He who has forgiven much loves much. And so she was absolutely devastated when Jesus went to the cross. He was her hope. He was her everything. She was so dedicated and she loved much. But let me, let me talk about that loving much. You know, for me, I was raised in a Christian home. And so when I finally walked as an adult with Christ after I was 24, you know, I, at first I kind of thought, well, God, you got a good deal, man. I'm, I'm ready to go, you know. And, and the problem is, I didn't realize how much I'd been forgiven of. So my love for God was less. And many of you that come out of a radical background, you, you embrace God so tightly at the beginning because you realized how much he has saved you from. But in all reality, there's very little difference between you who may have grown up in a Christian home and Mary Magdalene who was demon-possessed and 
very likely a prostitute. Why do I say this? I, I say this to encourage you, over your lifetime as you mature, you realize how much you've been forgiven of more and more through your life. And it's weird. You become a better person over time as you follow God, but you still realize more and more how much he really has forgiven you of. And you realize how glorious he is, and you realize how big the gap is between your righteous works, which are like filthy rags, compared to his absolute perfect righteousness. And and the, the only way to get into heaven is to be way better than you ever were. <laughs> and the only way to, get, to be that good is to receive Jesus Christ's righteousness in place of your own sinfulness. And I often use this illustration because I think it works and I think it gives us a picture to understand that even when you become a believer and you walk with God for 40 years seriously and you become a much better person, that you still need Jesus Christ just as much as that person that was on drugs or that person that may be in prison or that person who may have been a prostitute or or a drug dealer or whatever, you know, a molester, that you still need Jesus just as much as anybody else. Because because if if you were looking off the observation deck of the Empire State Building and you were looking down on people, could you tell who was taller than the other? Well, that's God's perspective on our righteousness. Our righteousness is is not much. And, And his righteousness is the top of the Empire State Building. Now, when you look at it from man's perspective, can you tell who's taller? So someone who's five foot is considered short. Sorry, Linda. But, um, <laughs> but you know, five foot is normally considered short, and I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, at least in America, that's considered short. And seven foot would be considered tall, right? So looking at it from a human perspective, it's obvious. This person is taller than the other person. And looking at someone's righteousness from a human perspective, it's pretty obvious that people like Billy Graham, who would never be seen with uh, another woman in a photo without his wife there, he's a pretty righteous guy, you know, compared to someone who may be, you know, a a drug dealer or, you know, someone who, who the society would consider very bad. And you look at those two and you say, well, obviously this one's taller. But that's from man's perspective. But it's God's righteousness is the top of the Empire State Building, and our, our, our righteousness is judged by him. Guys, there's no difference between you who are raised in church and someone who was saved out of a radical lifestyle. You both need salvation radically. That's what the book of Romans is all about. If you read it with this perspective, you got, you got Jews in Rome who become Christians. They got the pedigree. They got the law. They got the name. You know, they got family members that knew Jesus or whatever, you know. It's like they, they, they have the pedigree and, and they think they're better than those that were saved out of radical paganism. And you know what Paul is telling them? You're no better. You need Jesus just as much. Now, from an earthly perspective, we wouldn't see it that way. Now, I want you to consider this illustration again. So, so if you have someone that's seven foot sitting down at the bottom of the Empire State Building, and you have someone that's five foot, who has the greater chance of jumping up and high-fiving someone on the observation deck? Who has a better chance? I'm not saying a chance. I'm saying who has a better chance? The one that's seven foot, right? They have a better chance. What is their chance? It's still zero, right? So Billy Graham getting to heaven on his good works He has zero chance of doing it, right? We all need Jesus. And guys, we need to remember that because one of the things that turns off people in the world is the fact that once you become a Christian, you start to think you're better than other people. Are you really better? Think about Paul, probably the best Christian to ever live outside of Christ himself, right? Think about it. Gave the most, would have been dead multiple times. God kept him alive. You know, he was a Timex apostle took a licking and kept on ticking, right? He just kept on going, and he wouldn't stop. And he gave his all. But what did Paul say about himself? I'm the chief of sinners, right? In his maturity, he realized that he was no better than anybody else. And so I want to encourage you with that today. Just realize how much God loves you and how much you owe your salvation to God all of it, all of it, absolutely. And so here's this woman who 
obviously by her lifestyle, she recognizes how much she's loved, and she's just so passionately dedicated. I want to be dedicated like her. She showed up everywhere. Now, she's at the tomb, and it says there she's, she's weeping, which means she's sobbing. Her eyes are full of tears. And it says in verse 12, And then she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, angels, what did they look like? Well, we have different names for angels, but the basic term for angel just means messenger. Okay, that's, that, that's what it means. And then you have cherubim, and you have seraphim, and you have all these different, different names, archangels, so on and so forth. But, but what do they, they look like? Well, we have an indication in Luke chapter uh, 24, and it says, as, And it happened, as they were greatly pers- perplexed about this, as they're looking at the tomb, that, behold, two men stood by them in what? Shining garments. And I believe that just represents the righteousness. See, angels did not fall like the demons fell. They have no sin. And so there's a glowing righteousness to them. And that's one of the descriptions we can have of angels. And these particular angels were righteous angels. Now, this is interesting because in a couple places we see that when people saw, you know, there's one place where they actually talked with one of the angels. But, but, but in the gospel accounts, you have two angels, one at the head and one at the foot where Jesus had lain. Okay? Now, there is, I believe, a picture in the Old Testament of, of what's happening here. You see, in Exodus chapter 25, the Lord was telling Moses how to make this object that they were to meet God with, that they were to receive forgiveness by. And it was called the Ark of the Covenant. And we'll call that the box of the contract, right? This is God's contract with man. Ark means box, covenant means contract or deal. The box of the deal, okay? So he says, you shall make on top of this box what is called a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. Two feet by four feet, okay? And you shall make two cherubim, angels, of gold. Hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of its one piece with the mercy seat, okay? And um, so you had this mercy seat, this, this box. And the very top, that's called the mercy seat. And this is a rendition of what these cherub would look like. One at the top and one at the bottom, or one at, at each end, okay? Now, what would happen is a high priest would come in and he would sprinkle blood on top of this box and that would bring forgiveness for the nation now what's interesting about this if you go back into genesis chapter 3 god provides the first sacrifice the wages of sin is death adam if you if you do this you're going to surely die adam doesn't die right away what happens an animal dies in his place the first sacrifice was given by god remember he gave them animal skins how do you get animal skins had to kill an animal, right? So blood was shed in their place. The wages of sin is death. And so instead of God killing us right away, you you know, you're two years old, you say no to your parents, you're gone. (laughs) You know, we're all gone. God isn't able to redeem us, right? You know, it's just, so the wages of sin is death, but it's able to be put off because of sacrifice. You're recognizing the wages of sin is death and an innocent animal is gonna die in your place. And so what would happen is the high priest, when he's coming to seek forgiveness for the nation for the year, they would take the blood of a perfect sacrifice and they would bring it into the holy place and they would sprinkle it on top of this box. The wages of sin is death. And this represents um, the, the life being given in place of their life. Now, let's go a little bit further with this box. What is in this box? What is in this box are three things. Three things that represent the sinfulness of man and the faithfulness of God. First thing is manna. They have some manna. When they are traveling through the wilderness, what did the people do? God, you're going to kill us out here. You're not going to feed us, you know? And they're complaining against God who had rescued them through these 10 plagues and this miraculous, you know, going across, you know, just all this stuff that God did for them. And they're complaining like you can't take care of us. They're whining and complaining against God. They're sinning. What does God do? Gives them bread. Gives them manna. Their sin 
and God's faithfulness. Manna represents both those, doesn't it? The second thing you see in there is Aaron's rod that budded. Okay? What had happened was the people went to God and they were discontent with God's leadership. And what did God do? He identified his leadership that he had given them as a gift by having Aaron's staff grow a, a, a flower bud out of it. That was contained in here. Man's complaining, man's discontentment, man's sin, and, what, and God's saying, I've given you proper leadership. Here it is. And number three, the most famous thing that is in this box for us is the Ten Commandments. Right? When God was giving man the Ten Commandments, what was man doing at the bottom of the hill? Having a party. I mean, a rave. I mean, they were getting nuts down there. They were sinning. But God still faithfully gave them a way to fellowship with him through the Ten Commandments, revealing himself to them. Three symbols, man's failure, God's provision. And so what does God do? Wages of sin is death. In this box are three examples of your sin and three examples of my faithfulness. And I'm going to cover your sin with blood, with the blood of a sacrifice. And this is all foretelling what? Jesus Christ coming and being faithful to cover man's sinfulness. Now, I want you to think about it. You know, this is the mercy seat where we find mercy. And as Mary enters into the tomb, she is seeing the truth of the failure of man and the truth of the faithfulness of God. And what do we have? We have an angel on each end and the sacrifice that brings mercy on the world was in the middle. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Guys, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out more and more and more about how God put it all together. The greatest theologian is going to be like blown away in heaven because I don't think we've even scratched the surface of God's perfect word in how he puts everything together. And because this happened, we're able to come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't deserve that, but we get it because he did all for us. We're able to obtain that mercy, that mercy seat, and find grace and the help in the time of need. Now, it's believed that, that this was representing, in a sense, what is happening in heaven, the true tabernacle in heaven where Jesus Christ's blood is put onto the mercy seat. But he died so that you could come to God, and we see a picture of this even in the tomb. Then they said to her in verse 13, John 20, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, at this point, she doesn't realize yet that Jesus had risen from the dead, and she thinks someone stole him. Verse 14, now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. First of all, she didn't expect to see him, so it's like, you well, know, might look like him. But second of all, I want to point out that when it says that she was weeping, guys, it means that she was weeping. She was, she was just pouring out her heart. And I know, you know, we as men, we don't weep often, but you probably have wept at a certain time. But women would certainly know this a lot more because you're a lot freer in, in your ability to, to weep in our culture. But, but I always look at it this way. It's like I remember trying to look around one time when I was weeping, and I, everything was just really blurry and just kind of out of focus. It's like looking through a windshield when you're driving 70 miles an hour down the freeway. It's raining hard, and your wipers aren't working. You know, you can't see. And, and so she doesn't recognize Jesus. Now, she doesn't recognize it's him, but I want you to know it is Jesus. This is the first time Jesus appears to anybody prior to, or uh, after his resurrection. The first witness of Jesus is a woman. Isn't that interesting? A lot of people say this is proof that this religion that we have, this Christianity that we have, is not created by mankind, especially in that culture. Because, guys, women weren't allowed to testify in the court of law. And they weren't believed. As we're going to see, they weren't believed very well. But I think it's awesome. God elevates the, the, because what, God, what is God looking for? Gender? Or is he looking for faithfulness? How cool is it 
this woman is radically faithful, isn't she? And he reveals himself to her first. And if you were making up a religion in that culture, there's no way that you would try to prove Jesus rose from the dead and have your first witness be a woman. And so a lot of people would say, hey, texturally, this, this shows that, that this was not created by man. But she was faithful. And she was the chosen one to receive the first vision of Jesus when he resurrects, the first sight of Jesus. She had been at the cross when he died. She had been there when he was buried. She was with the group that went there Sunday morning. She stuck around longer even after they left. She looked inside of the tomb. She spoke with the angels, and she's still there. She's a faithful woman. Verse 15, then Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Now, it's interesting he thinks, she thinks he's a gardener. Again, there's a lot of evidence that this was a vineyard. So you have a garden of olive trees. You have a garden of, of vines. And, and so most likely it's, it's a vineyard. There's, there's archaeological proof of that. But remember, when Jesus was walking from the upper room to the, to the olive garden, to the garden of Gethsemane, and as he was walking, he would have walked by the, the temple and he would have seen the engraved grapevine on the temple, a, a symbol of Israel. And what did he say to them at that point in time? Really famous passage. I am the vine. You are the branches. You know, he who abides in me, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? And here he is. He dies in a vineyard. Also, I want you to, to think about it. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, what was his first miracle publicly? Water into wine, right? At a wedding, which also has a some significance. But water into wine, a lot of people say, look, he turned water into wine. We should be able to get drunk. No, Christians should never get drunk, okay? And then the argument is about whether a Christian should drink in our culture or whatever, okay? That's not what that passage is about, guys. Because most likely it was a priest's home, and they had these vessels that would would hold ritualistic water and, and and what he did was he turned this water that was in these old ritualistic things for the old covenant the old deal the old contract what did he do he filled them up with old water and what did he bring forth was new wine that was jesus's presentation it's new it's coming here i am old to new and, and the, the, this new deal is coming along. That, that miracle is not about whether a Christian should drink. That miracle is saying, ta-da, you know, I'm here. And it's happening. And I'm bringing in the new covenant. And then on the night he was betrayed, he took the cup, the fruit of the vine. He held it up and he said, this is my blood, which, is, uh, which represents life, life for life. Wages of sin is death, and I will take that death for you. I will pour out my life for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Think about how, how incredible that is. And, and so, so here he is in this, in this vineyard as he's being resurrected. And so she's supposing he, you know, he was carried away. Where have you taken him? Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. First thing to note here is, is that Mary looked at Jesus the first time and didn't see him because her tears filled her eyes. And we also know that she didn't keep her eyes on him. She turned around. Why? Because she had to turn back around when Jesus called her name. So two things Mary did here in her sorrow that we should be aware of. First of all, she allowed her tears to blind her. She allowed her her, her tears to stop her from seeing Jesus. And second of all, she was looking to the earth for the answer instead of to Jesus for the answer. Now listen, in the Lord, we should never sorrow beyond hope. Speaking of her tears, we should never sorrow beyond hope. And the reason I bring this up is because in this world, you're going to have tears, and God doesn't rebuke tears. In fact, tears are a blessing. Again, you know, I have a wife and two daughters, and sometimes they say, I just, I just need to cry. 
<laughs> you know, as a man, I don't understand that so much. But at the same time, physiologically and psychologically, something happens to you after a good cry. Right, ladies? Men, we can't testify of that very much. It, hap it still happens, and it's a blessing from God, and it's a release, right? There's a, there's a, you know, a clarity that comes after a good cry, and I think it probably happens with men too, but in our culture, we don't do that you know, as much. But, but there's a, you know, so it's a gift from God. Crying isn't the problem. But being so deep in sorrow that you refuse to receive hope from God in your sorrow. And there's a big difference in how people sorrow. And I encourage people with this who are going through great trials. And guys, every Sunday I hear of trials. And, and, and if you're around, we want to watch you to make sure that in your sorrow... You don't sorrow to the point of taking your eyes off of Jesus because he is your end hope. Many times, women will lose their husbands through death. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's more common that a man die younger than a woman. And so this is, this is common. And, and so I, I, I watched this throughout my life. I watched my own mother do it. And yeah, my mom missed my dad for 18 years before she rejoined him. But my mom sorrowed but still had hope. She sorrowed, but still could live the next day and still could look forward to the next day. She always missed my dad, but she sorrowed with hope. But I've seen other women who have lost their husbands who have refused that healing from God through hope. And, and it's just hard, and they push God away. And, and that's what I would say happens when your tears become so great that you're unable to see God. And, and, and it takes time. It takes time. And guys... You, you need to allow yourself to mourn. I'm a delayed mourner, you know? Like, my mom died two years ago. And, and it's weird because I'm mourning now. I'm grieving now, and it's just weird. But it happens to me. I've, I've been, you know, going through these weird emotions lately. But I know it's important that I actually go through them. That's not the problem. The problem would be is if I take my eyes off of God and push God out of my life. So, so when people mourn, yeah, let them mourn. And people mourn in different ways. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem comes, and you need to watch out for your loved ones and those around you if they start taking their eyes off of Jesus and, and they start completely losing hope. Hebrews, this hope we have is an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, Jesus Christ, having become the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is talking about Jesus Christ going and offering that final sacrifice in the tabernacle in heaven, right? He goes behind the veil and he forever opens the way for us. But we have what? We have this as an anchor for the soul. What does an anchor do? It, it holds you in the right place whether there's a strong current or not, whether it's a sunny day or not, and whether there's a storm or not. A good anchor you know, if you have a good anchor, it doesn't mean there's not going to be storms. You don't even need an anchor if you don't have storms, right, or if you don't have currents. But we need anchors. Why? This world is hard. And that hope that we have in the finished work of Jesus Christ is the anchor to our soul. And, and, and many of you are starting trials. Many of you are in the middle of trials. Many of you are at the end of trials. But even if you're not in a trial right now currently, make sure Jesus is the anchor of your soul. Because an anchor doesn't mean you won't have storms. An anchor doesn't mean you won't have currents. Anchor doesn't mean you won't have wind. It just means it keeps you in the proximity of Jesus Christ. Let him be the anchor of your soul. How about Peter? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through the faith for salvation, ready to be revealed to you in the last time. We have hope in heaven. Guys, there might be a last storm that takes my life, but you know what? I get to go to heaven. And if you're still here, tough luck for you, because I'm in heaven. I have this as a hope, and it's the anchor of my soul. Right? I mean, we, we have this in Jesus, but don't let the, the, the sorrow blind you from the promise of God. And I just so love it. It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by what? Your good works. No, it's kept by God. 
your church attendance. No, it's kept by God, the power of God. And I'm so glad it is because I'd screw that one up, right? It's kept by him, not by me. And that's an anchor, isn't it? Sure and steadfast. And so don't let your tears blind you from the hope that you always have in God. Again, he called her name and she had to turn around. Be careful when you're looking in the wrong direction. What does this look like? You go through a great sorrow, and instead of looking to God first, you start to just busy yourself with entertainment. Worse yet, you start busying yourself with relationships that you shouldn't be involved in. Or you start busying yourself with alcohol, or you start busying yourself with pornography, or you start busying yourself with all kinds of things that the world has to offer. The world does not have the answer for your peace. Jesus does. So we look to the earth for fulfillment and satisfaction. But where are we to look for fulfillment and satisfaction? To the Lord. We're supposed to look to the Lord. And she turned away. And just remember that. He is the answer. The promise is in Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. And this is a foretelling of what Jesus would say. This is like Jesus' words in the Old Testament, prophesied by Isaiah in chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison for those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Do any of these descriptions describe you? Any of this describe you? Have you had ashes in your life? God wants to bring you beauty for those ashes. Guys, I don't like the pain that I've gone through in life. I don't go, oh, it's so cool you did this to me. Except the fact that when I commit my hurts to God, I'm able to take my hurts from God in the past and bring them to the future and minister to people. You know, we had that concert a few weeks ago. And um, Rebecca St. James was there, and she was pregnant. But she had had two miscarriages since her first child. I know not just what a miscarriage is. I know what a full-term stillborn baby is. I don't go, oh, goody, goody, but I, I know the hurt and I've been healed. And there's joy after the morning. And I can share that with people. And instead of taking my hurts and having them depress me, I can take my hurts and use them as a tool to minister to other people and do good for all of eternity. What are you going to do? Are you going to let God take your hurts and use them for for his glory? Are you going to take your hurts and use them as an excuse to continue to push away from God? And so when you mourn, be aware that these things can happen. Watch out for those around you and point them back to fulfillment in Jesus. And I want you to know it as well. Jesus calls Mary by name to snap her out of her foolishness right here, doesn't he? Mary! That's just awesome. Can can you imagine when she recognized the tone of Jesus' voice right then, how everything changed? How radically everything changed like that. She thought he was dead. She Just total devastation in her life, all her hope gone. This guy that actually loved her, she's thinking no one else ever will. I'll be rejected again. What do I have? What future? And then all of a sudden, she just hears this tone of his voice. And it's, it's amazing because we all have, most of us here are able to speak, right? And we all speak differently. So when my wife calls me and I don't see the caller ID or whatever, and she calls me, she doesn't just say, hey, Rod, this is Noreen. What do we say? I know who you are. Like, you know, it's like, like offensive. Of course I know who you are. And Mary knew the voice of Jesus, that, that just his voice changed everything. Do you recognize his voice. Do you hear him call your name? And the way to recognize people's voices is to be with them a lot, right? To communicate with them a lot. To know how God speaks in your life to you. 
right? I think God is able to speak differently to each one of us. Sometimes, like for me, when God tells me no, it's like I'm bullheaded. He has to tell me no hard. <laughs> you know, a lot of times he leads people with yeses. With me, he leads me with no's. Don't go there, you know, because when that door shuts in your face, it's shut, you know, and I'm a little dense, so he has to talk to me loudly. But do you recognize the Lord's voice in your life? John 10. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his name. Now, I want you to think about the, in the culture of sheep herding in that day, uh, a bunch of shepherds would be out, especially in the spring when the grass is all fresh and ready to be eaten. They would take their sheep out, and they would wander around, but they would stay out for weeks at a time. And so they would, they would be out there, and they'd go, okay, I need to get to the sheep pen because the lions are out. And uh, so they would go to a sheep pen, but many times you'd have two or three shepherds go to one sheep pen, and they would just share it because it was like a community sheep pen. So they're in the sheep pen. How do you separate out the sheep in the morning? Well, what would happen is the shepherd would just go, let's go. And, and I haven't seen it yet, but I hear this is what happens. The sheep that belong to that shepherd get up and follow that shepherd, and there's no problem dividing out the sheep because they know his voice. Because a good shepherd knows his sheep well and attends to them, and they get to know him well. And they hear that voice, and they get up, and they separate themselves automatically right out. Now, a bad shepherd wouldn't pay any attention to the sheep, and maybe it'd be more of a problem. But I tell you what, when the Lord comes back to take us all out of this world and he says, come on up here, I want to recognize that voice and go, you know? I want to be separated out because I know his voice so well. Do you recognize the voice of God? And on top of that, you know, it's like, here's Mary. I mean, Jesus was warned about women like her. Remember at the, at the, the party that he was at in this, in this mixed group of people, and if he knew what kind of woman she was, he would never allow her to touch him. And, and so he was warned about but but Jesus knows her name. God knows her name. And we all like to name drop, don't we? Like, we won't admit that, but, you know, if we know someone famous, we'll, we'll get it into the conversation. I just mentioned that I got to talk to Rebecca St. James, you know, so. Um, <laughs> this name drop. But when I was on the surfing tour, I, I knew all the top surfers. I judged them, you know, and so they'd kiss up to me. It was really funny. Uh, but I liked that fact that these guys that were once my heroes and I'd see all over the surfing magazines, the best surfers in all the world, they, they knew me. And so one day I was surfing in San Clemente and I was with an old college friend and we were best friends, surfed all the time, went on surf trips, went to surf contests and everything. His name was Alistair and he was there in San Clemente with me visiting uh, from up north. And, and uh, as, as we were there, a very famous legendary surfer came up and he started to talk to me just out of the blue. Hey, Rod, blah, 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 in his Australian accent. And my friend is just going like this. And I'm going, oh yeah, you know, I'm just feeling all good. But what's that compared to the God, the creator of the universe, the savior of all mankind, knowing your name? Do you ever really think about the value of the fact that God knows your name? That's just an amazing thing. And so I tell you what, Mary was going in the wrong way. Her face was away from Jesus. Jesus calls her name and she snaps to you immediately. He didn't rebuke her. He just wanted her to turn around. And so with us, guys, when God calls our name, when Jesus calls, just turn around. You know what that turning around is called? It's called repentance. It isn't like I'm doing a bunch of bad works and I gotta not do those good. It's what direction are you going? Turn back around and go in the right direction towards Jesus. When he calls your name, recognize his voice and turn around. He knows my name. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your name, in a sense, is written on the palm of Jesus' hand, and he can't forget you. But I always think of it this way. You're written on his hands. 
The scars that he bore, he bore so that you could be saved. You could be saved. No, it's all those other people. No, it's you. It's you that were saved by the cross if you're a believer here today. So even if we make a mistake and turn away, he's still going to call us. Turn around and say, oh, I'm back. I'm here. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But I go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. So he says, don't hold on to me. And the idea isn't she hugs him and he says, don't do that. The idea here in, in, in the way the verb is, stop holding on to me. You can imagine Mary turning around and going, rah, you know, and like, I am not letting you go like an octopus, you know, it's like, man, I, you know, and he's going, wait, stop, I got stuff to do, and that's, that's kind of the, 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 the tone of it as you look at it in the Greek. Now, we, we do know that Jesus had other things to do, and it was very purposeful that they let him fulfill his time on earth and get to heaven. He had things he needed to do to get to heaven, and the reason he wanted to get to heaven was to fulfill the promise that he had given them in chapter 16 he says nevertheless i tell you the truth it is to your advantage that i go away for if i do not go away the helper will not come to you but if i depart i will send him to you and so several times even in that time that he was talking to him in the upper room he pointed to the fact that as he goes away bodily the holy spirit is going to be sent back spiritually and as he existed in one body for his incarnation his time here on the earth he can only minister in a certain area, the area of Israel. But what's going to happen now is the Holy Spirit's going to lead, or he, the Holy Spirit's going to come and indwell everybody on earth. So now he can spread out the gospel message all over the earth. There's one family line that was responsible for the gospel message. And, and, and there's 10 generations recorded from, from Adam and Eve to, to Noah. And then you have Noah's sons afterwards, and it seems like they're carrying the gospel message. They live for a long time. They outlive many generations after the flood. But during that time, man is rebelling, but they're responsible. And then there comes a time when most likely someone from that family is representing Mechizedek. In, in, in Mechizedek means king of righteousness, king of Salem, which means peace, king of righteousness, king of peace, bringing that responsibility now to Abraham, and Abraham will become a nation. So it goes from one family line carrying the responsibility of the, the truth of God. Now it goes to a nation carrying the responsibility of the truth of God. But that nation is still in one place. The, the, the temple is in one place. You only can worship at the temple. And Jesus is saying, this, this revelation that I'm bringing, it's going to continue to grow. And now what's going to happen through my death as I ascend, I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. Now, every single person that believes wherever they live, they become the temple of God. Don't we? And what happens in the temple? There's a witness. There's communication with God. There's worship of God. There's sacrifice to God in the temple, right? And that's what we become, each one of us. And so God's plan is Jesus is saying, yes, I'm, but I'm, I've completed the work now after, since I've done this thing, what's going to happen is now all of you can now be a witness all over the world wherever, and now salvation is going to expand and explode all over the earth and not just be in one centralized place. Jesus told the woman at the well, there's going to come a time when you don't have to drink, you know, from these wells in order to be spiritually fulfilled. It's going to come out of you. You're going to be the source of it as we are, as we're believers. And so that's what Jesus is looking at. He's not looking at her like, woman, you're bugging me. It's like, wait, wait, stop. There's many things to do. And when I go, man, you're going to see the fulfillment of that. And that's what we experience even today. And so He encourages, hey, don't hold on to me, but I, I need to fulfill, and it's going to be a blessing to everybody, including you. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Mark tells us what? Very last verse, they did not believe. <laughs> but it comes a point where you need to believe. And God didn't get mad at them. He met their unbelief. Here's the thing, guys. If you have questions that are holding you back in your, your walk, ask the questions. 
Truth is not afraid to be questioned. There is a warning, though. God is so immense and so far beyond us. There's some questions that you're not even able to understand at the sight of heaven. His ways are beyond our ways. At the same time, I don't think that's our problem as Christians. Very much, I, I think our problems as Christians is we don't investigate and ask enough questions. Because when God starts answering those questions, what happens to your faith? It grows. And you move forward and you step out in more faith and you're doing more incredible things for God and you're willing to, to test him in a sense. Like, God, you say this is true. I'm going to live it. And then what happens is on the way you get more questions and you ask more questions and he's able to give you more answers. He also becomes more of a mystery because he isn't able to give you all the answers, but you're so much closer to him. You know how much is out there and you know how much you now know, but you're still being in awe of God. And it's just this incredible thing as you, as you seek to answer. And, and see, they had their doubts, but he eventually shows up to them. He's going to answer their questions without rebuking them. But the key is when you ask questions, ask, ask honest questions. Don't ask questions to push God away from you, and sometimes we do that. Or don't say, well, you know, and have a question, but don't seek out the answer. Many people criticize the church because they don't really want to deal with God. And they just, they just throw out a criticism, but really they're just pushing God back. Or some Christians that don't want to grow, they don't want to be challenged, they criticize other Christians or they criticize certain things. Guys, it doesn't take a high spiritual IQ to criticize things or point out problems. Ask the right questions with the right heart, and God is going to draw you into deeper faith. You need to trust God. You need to grow in your faith. Without faith, it is impossible to, to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You can do all these good works, but unless you believe in God, none of those good works carry into reward in heaven because you're not in heaven. You're still paying for the wages of your sin. And so you need to be in the game. You need to believe. Faith is what makes the transaction of forgiveness and eternal life take, takes, take place. Faith drives your actions here on earth. You act upon your beliefs. You know, in, in government, a lot of people ask, they're, they're afraid of Christians being in government. You know why? You're going to vote based on your beliefs. You know what the next question is? What do you vote on? What does anybody vote on? What does anybody act upon? Their beliefs. So, so their answer is, well, I, I, I vote upon um, nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like I'd rather someone vote upon their beliefs than vote upon nothing. Or better yet, I'd rather someone vote upon the truth of God's eternal word that is tested more than any other piece of literature in all of history and has never been proven false rather than on your 40, 50, or 60 years of experience. Are you kidding me? You're a radical sinner. And as we're learning, you're a pervert too, you know, or whatever. You know, it's like all this craziness going on, and I'm going to believe you that you're going to make the right choice based upon all your experience. You've got to be kidding me. Guys, I'm a moron compared to God's word. Unless I'm going to give you the truth and the principles of God's word, don't listen to me. That's stupid. You know, people, oh, pastor, you give me so much. I go, good material, because I'm dumb. It's God's word. And if I walk away from God's word, you walk away from this church as quick as you can. Because it's just man's wisdom. And the smartest man is an idiot compared to God's stupidity, which he doesn't have any. But God says it that way as a comparison. Right? So, so you need to trust God more and grow. And so even as these disciples had doubts, what did God do? He answered. He answered their doubts. Remember Thomas wasn't there when he showed up to the guys that were doubting here? And what does God do with Thomas? He comes up again and shows him again and meets his honest question, not the stupid questions to push God away. You know, if you want to push God away, God will respect that. You know, heaven or hell, your choice. God will respect that decision. Faithless life or faith-filled life, you make the choice. God will respect your decision. You want to be used by God and make a difference for all of eternity or not? God will respect your decision. Honest answers, though, help you grow. I don't think Christians ask enough honest questions to continue to grow. John wrote at the end of this chapter, these are written that you may believe, and we want to grow in our belief. What do we believe? God loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is today the day that you start to trust your life to Jesus? Second question, is today the day that you start to again trust your life to Jesus? I had to do that at age 24. I didn't get saved at age 24. I got saved at age 8. But I had to recommit to trusting God with my day-to-day life at age 24. And, And I recommitted to Jesus. He never had to recommit to me. He never left me. I, I, I turned my back on him, and he actually respected that choice. And, and I didn't live a fruitful life for quite a while. So if that's you, return to Jesus. Return to that faith in Jesus. He has his name written in the palm of his hand. And it's not someone else that he died for. He died for you, and we need to remember that, especially during this season. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you once again for your word, for your truth. Lord, we thank you for the amazing way that you unfolded it all. We thank you that we get to live this side of the cross and be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we never take that for granted. May we take it as marching orders. May we take it as just a blessing to be able to unashamedly serve you with abandon. So, Lord, just minister to us during this season and beyond, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.